Hello and welcome to Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. My name is Dan Demite. I'll be your host for today's episode, and I am joined here in the illustrious uh, Damascus Media Studio with my good friend Aaron Richards and Brad Pierron. Yes. Are we ready for a great adventure today, brothers? Maybe the greatest. I the greatest. Maybe of the greatest. All time. Yeah, yeah. I think yes, the greatest of all time yes. today, right now. At a table, At, like yeah, this, sitting like, down. This is going to turn into a whitewater rafting experience. Sitting down, yeah, sipping great, coffee. <clears throat> yeah, this is but. the. Yeah. Okay. Hey, if you're watching this podcast for the first time, uh, like we said, this is where encounter meets mission. We like to take a question from the audience, usually about mission and how we can share our faith. Mm -hmm. And then we each give our own two cents. So we have two pennies here. We throw them in the jar. We give our two cents. And then we end the episode with giving a mission for the week. So Mm -hmm. how you can actually be a missionary with us and live out the answer to this question in your daily lives. It's very exciting. But this isn't just a show about mission. It's a show on mission as well. So for every person who subscribes to Beyond Damascus, we have a generous mission partner who will give $10 to send a camper, a child, to our summer camp. And so Catholic Youth Summer Camp is a ministry that we provide here at Damascus. It changes kids' lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of children are unable to come because they can't afford it. So if you hit that subscribe button, you just push it and ten dollars like goes towards a camp scholarship. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the official noise it's of the, the <laughs> subscribe button. <laughs> Trademark it, yeah. Jack. <clears throat> hey, Jack. Hey, speaking of Jack, speaking we have of. the beautiful bearded Jack Parker <laughs> who is going to give us our question. As many B of adjectives as we can do. Yeah. The question of the week is how do I talk about the Eucharist to people who don't believe? How do we talk? How do I talk about the Eucharist to those who do not believe? I like oh, it. Let's I love that. Ponder. I want to jump yeah, on that's it. That's a big question. Okay, so uh, this is this is a great question. We, we, we work here at Damascus on. and one of our, uh, on. our kind we, of our Yeah, we, our well, flagship, apparently we uh, do not work very hard at flipping coins there, Our flagship Aaron. ministry is hard at Catholic Youth Summer Camp and uh, one of the one of the just spoke right through. <laughs> <laughs> Stay the course. Stay the course. Um, the Eucharist is the is the center. It's the center of the heart of our ministry, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I when I think about why or how I can explain Euchar- the Eucharist to to Christians who don't who don't believe in the Eucharist, I just I look back to the to the incontrovertible evidence that's that's present in the early church and the teaching of the church fathers. Uh, I was just reading the other day through Isaiah chapter six, um, where Isaiah has this this miraculous vision of the coal that's placed on his tongue, and um, I, I've heard that story preached by 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 teachers across denominations for years. And I was just doing a little research on it, and I went back and okay, there there it is. The church fathers interpreted this reading as an absolute prefigurement to the Eucharist. Hmm. That when that when the body of Christ is placed on our tongue, the the man with eyes like flames of fire, that our that our uh, it brings about our conversion, our divinization, and our and our uh, assignment to mission. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm just like man, there's there's so much. You know, I I would I would challenge you to look at the teachings of the church fathers as it pertained to the celebration of the the Lord's Supper, or as it pertained to the celebration of the Eucharist in the in the early church. That. Uh, all of them believed in the in the true presence of Jesus. There, there's a, another great example. If you want to see it, not only just in the teachings of theologians, but even in the practice of everyday Christians in the early church. There's an amazing saint that we that we speak about here at Catholic Youth Summer Camp. That's why I brought it up earlier. Uh, his name is Saint Tarsicius. He was he was alive in the 200s. He was a Roman a Roman boy, and in the midst of the development of the church in a very hostile time. Saint Tarsicius was an altar server, and uh, for whatever reason, on a particular occasion, the church needed to transport a consecrated host, the Eucharistic body of Jesus, to from one from one location uh, where mass was being celebrated to another where somebody needed to receive. And Saint Tarsicius volunteered because it would be too dangerous for the priests to go out and to to walk amongst the hostile city. Uh, he volunteered to carry the Eucharist and he held it close to his chest. And as he was running through the town, he was chased by a, a group of uh, individuals who, when they found that he was Christian, uh, persecuted him to the point of death. And uh, as he was being beaten and kicked and abused on the side of the street in the middle of Rome, he he never let go of the Eucharist that he clutched to his chest. 
until he was finally approached by a soldier who was who was a covert Christian. Uh, and in his dying breaths, he he released his hands and was and and gave the the Eucharist to this soldier. Mm. Like that that's the intensity with which everyday Christians, the priests and the theologians believed in the presence of the Eucharist for the first fifteen hundred years of our of our history until the time of the Reformation when we when we decided to begin taking liberties with this teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. yeah it's, uh, I mean, you literally just Google Church Fathers. In the real presence or church fathers in the Eucharist, I, I, and you have just there's like just tons of different church father quotes yeah. on it. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just crazy stuff. Like here's um, Ignatius of Antioch from mm-hmm. uh, uh, 110 AD, right? So this is pretty much right, like yeah. pretty that's, doggone that's, close, that's right? Ten years after the Gospel of John was written. Mm-hmm. I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ who was the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, Mm -hmm. which is incorruptible. (laughs) Then he goes on uh, in a different area. He says, take care then to use one Eucharist so that whatever you do, you do according to God. For there is one flesh for our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup in union with his blood, one altar, and there is one bishop with the priesthood or the presbytery. It's just Mm -hmm. crazy. I mean, they, they definitely had this, yeah. passion for the Eucharist. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, even when you, when you read through Acts two and, and it's saying that they devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers, like yeah. that, that's to what we now know as liturgy. Like that's what they were, they were devoting themselves to. Jesus said to pray like this. And, and he said to do this in memory of him. And he said that this was his body and that this was his blood. And so we, we do this. And like, there was such a commitment to that, even in the earliest part of the church, this is like right after Pentecost. I mean, this is birthplace of the church. Yeah. Just immediately after. And then all the way into the church fathers. And, and I mean, for the first 1500 years of the church, like when you, when you read through Aquinas and Augustine and you move all the way back to Polycarp Mm -hmm. and Ignatius of Antioch, I mean, it's, it is, oh, it can, it's overwhelming. When I think sometimes when we like, so what's, how do I talk about the Eucharist to people who don't believe? I think it is appealing to a sense of reason. I remember when I didn't have faith in the Eucharist, I really Mm -hmm. struggled as a, a kid, like, just with the rational thought, you're telling me this is the body and blood of Jesus. Like I couldn't think through it. And so, but then some people were like, they gave me John chapter six and they're like, just read John chapter six, what he says. And they gave me church fathers, like read what the church father said. And then they gave me John Paul II, like read what JP two said. And I, I just started reading and thinking through, I'm like, Hey, this actually, like this makes sense. Like yeah. it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't, I couldn't get the rational jump to say, that this could possibly be true. But now I'm seeing it in the mm-hmm. words of Jesus. I'm seeing it in Acts of the Apostles. I'm seeing it in the early church. And so then reason starts to kick in, which then allows you to submit to faith, right? The, I think, what do they call theology? Faith, like, uh, faith builds on uh, understanding. And so like, mm-hmm. uh, like we want to under, like understand our what we believe by faith. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Theology is faith seeking understanding. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what Yeah, that, no, that's Aquinas. And I, I think it's, <laughs> we, well, I mean, if we're talking to our Protestant brothers and sisters, a lot of times they speak of impartation. And we speak about that in the church too. Um, peace be with you and with your spirit. There's impartation of peace. It's what Jesus did after the resurrection, right? So um, God wants to impart his life to us. But the church fathers are often seeing this as Jesus wanting to divinize us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wants to consume us from the inside out. So to Aaron's point, like how do I speak about the Eucharist? Confidently, mm. confidently, because like, Con, con fide with faith. Like, mm-hmm. like when I have faith and I can confidently just say like, no, I believe in this. And, and he, here's some of my reasons mm-hmm. why, like not to be blown around by the winds of the time, but to stay confident in that. Now listen to the things, but, but you can stay confident, right? Yeah. Because of I mean, all the things that Aaron was saying. That's Beautiful. awesome. I'll Beautiful. go next. I'll go next. Boop, boop. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so how do I speak about the Eucharist to people who don't believe? I think it'd be really fun to appeal to um, faith as well. So like appealing to reason and appealing to faith. So just really kind of lay out like Eucharistic miracles and mm. and some of the Eucharistic miracles and you can just mm. Google them, but just read about the Eucharistic miracles. I, I, I can't for the life of me, like uh, as I, I, I read about these Eucharistic miracles, I'm like, I, I don't uh, like, this is insane. This really happened. It like, so just appeal to these awesome miracles. And then I don't know, like I like to appeal to miracles, um, in my own life as well, right? Like how, how is the Eucharist 
really impacted me and transformed my own life. So give testimony. You don't have to give theological doctrine on the Eucharist. You can just simply answer the question, well, why do you believe in the Eucharist? And you have a reason that you believe. And so learn to articulate your own testimony. What did God do in your life through the power of the Eucharist? And, you know, I was on a committee for um, uh, the Eucharistic revival, and we were talking about different ideas. And I, was, I started the committee. Uh, I mean, one of the meetings, I was like, we should we should just start every meeting by sharing about a Eucharistic miracle. And they're like, oh, that's a good idea. And they they research Eucharist and they start reading like the miracle of Luncia. Yeah, I'm like, no, no, don't read a miracle that happened 500 years ago. Let's share about miracles that we have witnessed in our own life of people who have been healed or transformed by the Eucharist. And it was really cool because it forces mm-hmm. us to say, okay, yeah, I I have I I have a I know of a woman who was healed from cancer through through the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. I know someone who was healed in prayer ministry in front of the Eucharist. I know that. And, and then you start sh- sharing these stories and it builds faith that, wow, this is truly, this, this is real. That's and then awesome, Dan. I, when you appeal to faith, I think put your money where your mouth is, right? So what does um, Elijah do when he's trying to get people to return to the, the living God? Well, he pours water on a sacrifice and he says, okay, hear me, oh God, bring fire down, right? And fire comes down. So if you want to testify that the Eucharist is real, take a person to adoration and simply say, listen, I'm going to let God give evidence that he is real. So just sit here in the presence of the Eucharist and ask him, Jesus, is this you? And I love this because so <clears throat> I've heard from so many of our campers who have done this where they're like, is this you? And then he actually speaks to them and mm-hmm. and and he shows them, he, he manifests himself to them. And so you don't have to convince the person just teach him about adoration and and let them ask him, are you who you say you are? And let him say yes. That's really good. Yep. I, I also like heightening the stakes to show the faith sometimes. So like if I'm giving a message on the <clears throat> Eucharist or something like that, I, I will just say the quiet part out loud. Like if this is not Jesus, we are all wasting our time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because yep. when you heighten those stakes, all of a sudden you're claiming where your faith's at. You're saying, but here's the reason I believe. Right, and and that always shows that I'm I'm not afraid of what the counterpoint is, because I've come to taste and yeah. see that the Lord is good. Yeah. I've seen it. what He's done. Yeah, exactly. And I do think that that allows us to just again, the faith is the strength of the church, not the weakness. Mm-hmm. And so often we're like, faith is is weaker than reason. No, faith is on the far side of reason. Think about as many things as you want to, as long as you want to, and yet there's going to be a gap. And whatever you fill that yeah. gap with, you can call it mystery in the secular sense, or you can call it mystery in the religious sense. And I fill the gap of mystery with faith. And yeah. and I think, yeah, because how do you get your mind around Jesus fully present in what is evidently to the eyes a piece of bread? I mean, we can we can go into the transubstantiation around stuff, but you're going to get to a part where it's like, I can't really think much more about this, yeah. you know? Yeah which is a strength, not a weakness. All right, your two cents, Brad. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's interesting because, uh, well, I'm gonna try to get around the microphone. I'm, oh, I still geez. missed one. Like, that's, that's like a missed layup. Yeah, that's God, so yeah, that's that pathetic. Was, yeah. yeah, so if any of you play basketball- and, March uh, Madness I going judge, on Brad. here. I won't I know. judge. I, I am myself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, Jack, <laughs> okay. this, why does the beautiful bearded Jack always laugh at Aaron's <laughs> the jokes? The beautiful bearded brave Jack. We're just gonna keep adding a B adjective like every time. Um, I, I- I'm in a similar strain to both of you, but I, I'll appeal to Matthew 28, where Jesus says, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Like the best way to get people to start entertaining your ideas is seeing where you're in agreement, not where you're in disagreement. And what we would all agree upon is that Jesus did say that. We would agree that Matthew, the tax collector who followed him, did attest to him speaking this. He said, behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Okay, so if we agree that he's with us always, it's not a huge leap to say, if he's with us always invisibly, which we would all universally within the Christian faith say, that he would also be with us visibly because the invisible God became incarnate once Mm -hmm. for all. Mm -hmm. So to say that he remained incarnational Mm -hmm. to his body, the church, is not a strong leap. It just requires us to have the confidence to stand on that and to say, to our Protestant brothers and sisters, even some of our Catholic brothers and sisters that have fallen away from the belief in the true presence, right? Mm-hmm. To say to them, hey, let's let's look at 
Matt, like if you're in a real dialogue about this, I'm not going to say bring up Matthew 28, like on the, the street when you're in a passing conversation. But if, if this is a real dialogue you're having, just say, Hey, can we look at Matthew 28 together? So, so here Jesus says, behold, I'm with you always. And you and I both believe that we're, we're saying two different ways that he's with us always. I actually still think the way you're saying he's with us is true. Yep. I'm just adding that he's also said that he's with us incarnationally, body, blood, soul, and divinity, body and soul that Jesus didn't become incarnate just 2000 years ago to show people he could, mm-hmm. he's remained with us. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he entrusted that to the apostles who handed it down to the church. And I think that just, it makes it elementary and rudimentary. It, it doesn't get into these high lofty um, exegesis of Augustine's writings, right? It, it's, it's like, yeah, we can, some of us like doing that, but that's not, that, the, the best way is to say, where are we in agreement? Where are we actually in disagreement? And this is, and again, where you heighten the stakes, at least in my opinion, like I have tons of friends from my hometown because we're, we're kind of the beginning of the Bible Belt down in Southern Ohio. And so m- almost everyone believes in God, but it's, it's usually like a, a, of different Protestant persuasions. And so I'll be in Bible studies with them and I'll, we'll regularly come to this. And what, mm-hmm. I, what I regularly attest to is, yeah. is exactly what I'm saying. Hey, this this makes tons of sense to me. Here's why I've put my faith in this and then continuously doubling down on that and showing. So again, I would say, um, how, how should we talk about the Eucharist? I would talk about it confidently and I would talk about it faithfully, but I would also talk about it in an informed way. And if you want to be informed, Matthew 28, I think is the, the simplest way yeah. to get to agreement. I love that. The yeah. feeling of the incarnation is beautiful. Yeah. I, I think that's so the and it does we all it, agree on it. Yeah. And and it's it's why it's uh, like Aaron, you mentioned at the beginning this the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Catholic faith, the catechism says, but it's also the source and summit of what how we minister to kids here at Catholic yeah. U Summer Camp and Damascus Ministries is because the, the it's so incarnational. And like they right. want they like the human person is craving. A, a a tangible experience with God. That's like a, a, we 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 want more than just the spiritual. Yeah. We want more than just we, we're because in space we're and human. time. Yeah, we're in yeah. space and time. Yeah, and yes. so we need it. And so he, out of his goodness, his love, mm-hmm. his mercy, he gives it to us. Yeah. Well, if he would have wanted to make us angels, he would have. But he didn't. He put us exactly. Yeah. That's such yeah, yeah. a good point. Would man. you guys tolerate a little addendum today? Yes, um, I would love a it. Third Uh-oh. cent, a fourth cent. Well, what was your addendum? I, I'm just I'm surprised this didn't come up in any of our in any of our statements. That it, if if I'm really going to witness to the the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, I have to change the way that I approach the Eucharist. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely agree. Yeah, go further into that. Like the, if I if I believe this is this is God, I I have to demonstrate that not just through my teaching, but by my example. Yes. That that. Like I, I can't say that and then also not spend any time with him. I yes. can't say that and then also be distracted without concern at mass. Mm-hmm. Good. Uh, I, I really, I really, you know, I, I need to, I need to demonstrate by my lifestyle mm-hmm. that I'm no, I'm not willing to miss mass this week. Why? Because I believe this is Jesus. Yes. Right. Because I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice on family vacation to leave my family behind and go and spend time with Jesus. Or, or where were you this afternoon? I was, I was in the chapel. Why? Because that's the lifestyle that I live. Yep. 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 That's so good. Yeah. Cause I, I was just, uh, um, writing a talk that, that had some of this in it and yeah, I mean, well, we're incarnational. So the faith that we have, we, we need to put into action, right? Yeah. Like we are saved by grace through faith worked out in love worked out like that that is the beauty that's the beauty thing is like yeah. i'm partaking in the grace that's given to me right and like i think uh, the beginning of the catechism says and i think i've quoted this before but god infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to share in his own blessed life for that reason at all times and in all places god draws close to man that's what we're saying in the Eucharist. That's why it's the source and summit because Jesus said he's the alpha and the omega. God's drawing close to you, so close to you that he's down the street in your church. He's like right down the street and go there on Sunday. And, and I think what breaks my heart sometimes is we go to this, this beautiful parish here in the diocese and there are so many families and I know they don't mean it this way, but like they leave right after they receive Jesus. And it's like, man, if, if there's a way that the one night stand culture has made its way into the church, that's it. I come to get what I was looking for. And then I, it's like, no, no, like, Oh no, no, that's the moment where you're like, God, thank you. Change my life for the rest of this week, right? Like engage that. I love that, Aaron. That's so important. And we did kind of 
I think gloss over that. So I think that's we important. did. And uh, Jack, could you please make note? This was the ah, this was the sense. episode I knew where it. Aaron violated the format. <laughs> I knew Wait, Dan I knew and I have done does this not religiously. Violate the format often, Dan. but he did. And so, and Brad, could you please tell us what does Catechism twenty seven thirty nine say? I, I don't know, but no, I you did didn't memorize the whole no, thing. No, Dang no, it! Okay, I, uh, I have certain. Yeah, All right. Well, since I will abide by the format of the show, this is the point of the show where we move on from the question of the week to the mission of the week, where we grill we, Brad with questions. Of the yeah, we want to see uh, what what mission you have for the week based off of this question. So, anyone have a mission for the week? I've got a fun one. All right. Yeah, do it. Okay. Uh, it's it's very simple. If if you are uh, a, a non Catholic Christian who is who is still struggling with this, or if you know someone who is, I want you to jump on YouTube and look up Francis Chan Communion, okay, or Francis Chan Eucharist. Uh, if you don't know Francis Chan, he's he's an awesome and very uh, influential communicator of the gospel. He's 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 had a a, a really high degree of notoriety in non Catholic circles. Um, I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really changed my life through his teaching. And Francis is is a man who has never been afraid to pursue truth, whatever the cost. And in the last probably five or six years, uh, Francis himself has begun an investigation into kind of some of the things we talk, we've talk we been talking about regarding the history of the church and looking back to the fathers and what it is that the church taught without error or without variance for 1500 years regarding the Eucharist and has has really stepped into a place of, of kind of making a statement. If, if this is what the church says is true, then I'm gonna shift my whole lifestyle of preaching to make this its center. Uh, it's just some very awesome convicting uh, reality. That's that's good. Yeah, and I, it's amazing what God is doing in our Protestant brothers and sisters yeah. across the globe to bring them into a deeper faith yeah, yeah. Uh, in the real presence. And and granted, they're not there yet, right? But the, it's like God is doing something to well, bring them into an awareness of His. We're, his, we're in the midst of the uh, Eucharistic revival right now. Yeah, and a number of non-denominational Protestant organizations and churches from around the world have sort of collaborated to declare this communion revival time. Right. Um, where they believe that unity in the church is going to be restored through understanding the presence of Christ in communion. Yeah, it's if, crazy. If, 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 you, if, you, if you try to paint with sweeping judgments as to what Protestants believe, uh, there are many non-Catholic Christians, um, I don't know if it's the minor, minority or the majority, who actually do hold to, uh, to the best of their degree, uh, to the best of their capacity, a scriptural perspective on the real mm -hmm. presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. The ones who we typically would identify as not believing that would be the ones who are kind of a, a part of the mainline Protestant, sure. uh, Lutheran, yeah. um, Presbyterian, yeah. sort of everything that came directly out of the the Reformation. Yeah, your Calvinist persuasions. Yep. And it's not, <clears throat> I mean, not not that you're suggesting this at all, but for our listeners that may not know. So we we as Catholics believe it's not that the belief in the bread is what makes it the real presence. Sure. It's, it is the the apostolic uh, priesthood that has made it the, the substance real, yeah, differently. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's and, transformed. And so there's that, but God is renewing their minds and he, and, and hopefully God will bring people back into union with the church so that yeah. we are, are yeah. all one. Why? Because the Eucharist is meant to be the, the, the source of unity in, in the, in the faith. So the mark of oneness, the mark of community is the body blood soul. It's communion. called <laughs> communion. Yeah. It's common union. That's yeah, yeah, what yeah. it is. Um, I, I have a, I have a mission of the week. I think, um, for those of you who are listening, I think on the other uh, other side of the the fence that that are Catholic, I want to encourage you this week to go to a time of adoration or prayer with the tabernacle, or go to a daily mass you usually wouldn't go to this week. And when you're there, engage with Jesus like He's present, like He's there, like He wants to speak to you, like He wants to do things through you, like He wants to commune with you, like He wants to literally consume you from the inside out. Like because I think when we start doing that, we start just being the Christians we were made mm -hmm. to be. So again, just find a, a church close to you, maybe on the way home from work, maybe on your way to work, go to a daily mass, go in there for 15, 30 minutes, an hour, and spend time with the tabernacle or with adoration. We can all find those pockets in our day. I think that would, uh, it would be a, a first step in a, a real transformation. It's a good mission of the week. My mission of the week will be, if you attend a weekly holy hour, um, then invite someone with you this week uh, that doesn't really believe in the Eucharist. Just give it a shot. And they may say no, but at least you invited them. And if they say yes, then 
their life could be changed forever. And maybe so, even seek a yes. Like if they say no, maybe ask another yeah, person. Who exactly. Yeah, 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 go after yeah, yeah. it. All right. Um, awesome. Those are good missions. My friends, thank you so much for joining us on Beyond Damascus, the show where encounter meets mission. Uh, I am so grateful for your uh, joining us. I don't know what I was going to yeah. say there. Yeah, yeah. But um, we would love to enc- encourage you to share this episode with anyone who maybe is struggling with their belief in the Eucharist. So feel free to hit the share button, send it to a loved one, a friend, whatever. Mm-hmm. If you have any questions you want us to answer, uh, make a comment, send them uh, to us, and we will be happy to answer them. Join us next week on Beyond Damascus. And remember, mission, mission makes, makes sense. Mission makes sense. Oh, C E N. T.S. Brad, you were Get it? so delayed. I bet it was, uh, you're supposed to join in all the way. Let's try again. Ha, Let's try again. Friends. And remember <laughs> that mission <laughs> makes, makes sense. sense. Get it? All right, done. <laughs> we'll see you guys. <laughs>